Welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show, a program dedicated to bringing you vital and uncompromised truths that you won't hear in the mainstream media, discussing contemporary issues in light of the Bible and how these issues relate to family, culture, and the church. The heart of this show is to glorify Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness as He is commanded in Ephesians 5.11. Now here's your host, Good Fight Ministries' own Chad Davidson. Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And with me, as always, is the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Being blessed, brother. Amen. Amen. And as always with us is the show's producer, Tony Palacio. How are you doing today? Praising God for all of his goodness. Amen to that. And you didn't even tell anyone where I was and why I sound <laughs> weird, Tony. But yeah. <laughs> if you guys were listening to yesterday's show and you're listening right now, I am out in Texas. Blessed Oak Chapel, as well as Good Fight Ministries, has sent myself and a team of 17 guys and gals to share the gospel out here in Texas. And it's what a perfect topic today to be discussing, I think, Maybe a game changer when you come when it comes to what sharing the gospel truly is and what you're sharing when you share the gospel. And I think there could not be a better topic to discuss when it comes to sharing the gospel than repentance. And Joe recently did a message at, at length, and I encourage you guys to check it out. We are literally at I'm sitting here at a live group in Bolverde, Texas, right outside of San Antonio. And this this entire group is made up of people that are involved looking at the doctrines and caring about the teachings, watching the live stream of Blessed Hope Chapel. And just recently, Joe did a message, and I want you to check it out. If you go to blessedhopechapel.org, if you go to Blessed Hope Chapel's YouTube channel, Facebook page, you will find his recent message on repentance. And I really encourage you to check that out because i believe it'll be a great supplement to this teaching you're going to listen to today this podcast show so with all of that that long introduction i have to ask you joe before we talk about whether or not repentance is necessary for salvation i think it's important if we deal with the term what on earth joe or actually what biblically what on the bible what in the bible is repentance yeah uh there's two huge deceptions going on right now and uh you could actually say three uh there are those who teach that repentance doesn't really entail or involve or end in a turning from actual sin uh they empty uh the biblical definition the biblical portrayal the biblical demand of repentance uh from its meaning uh they'll pick up the greek word and and they'll say, oh, essentially it means to have a change of mind. So really it just means to change your mind about who Jesus is. So you can just, you know, continue to be in rebellion to him. Just believe he died for your sins and you're saved. Even though you haven't turned to him and you're living a wicked lifestyle, you might be filled with murder and hate in your heart and lust and adultery. And But you'll, you'll still be saved. So there's those who empty it of its meaning. That's one huge deception to reinterpret or I should say uh, to just, you know, empty repentance of what the Bible clearly teaches it is. And number two, uh, there's those that'll say, yeah, you know, it does mean you have to, you know, have a change of heart, change of mind, change of will about uh, sin, and and it's you have to embrace Jesus through faith, and and they'll admit that it's the acknowledgement that uh, sin is evil and to turn from sin in your heart. But then they'll say, but it's not essential for salvation. Uh, you can, you know, be a believer and reject being a disciple. You can accept Jesus as your Savior, but reject Him as as your Lord. And so some will say, some will just empty of its meaning and then also say it's not necessary. Others will say, well, it obviously means it has, it entails ultimately the fruit of it at least is turning from sin. But, you know, it doesn't mean you don't need to because it's optional. So there's two heresies regarding a repentance there. And then sadly, and this is probably true of more churches than not, a lot of churches have an orthodox creed or statement of faith regarding repentance. They will define repentance as having a genuine change of heart and mind about turning and following Jesus and bearing fruit as evidence of that repentance. And they'll also have in their statements of faith that it's necessary for salvation. I think most churches, by and large, are still orthodox in that way. Uh, However, 
uh, most of those churches today, or many of them at least, just neglect it. They just don't teach repentance. It's, you know, so they basically end up teaching the same heresies by default. So by just, you know, not wanting to offend people or what have you. And if, you know, and I found, you know, that there's, you know, a lot of those variations, there's, there's three different variations that just really break my heart. And, and this is an important topic, it has been to us for years and years and years. Uh, Paul talked about how he did not, you know, fail to declare the whole counsel of God there in Acts chapter 20. And he talks about how he preached repentance as he shared with them house to house. And that was part of the whole counsel of God. And so when we look at repentance, essentially repentance, the Greek word metanoia, especially in its biblical context, has to do with a change of heart and a change of mind regarding sin and our relationship with God. And it has to do with an inward volitional uh, turning from rebellion against God to the Lord Jesus Christ, from sin toward faith in the Lord. And it's interesting because uh, the fruit of our repentance, the works that would follow are not repentance in itself. Uh, it's the, the uh, works, uh, fruit, that's the evidence of repentance. I would say just like faith without works is dead, uh, without any works, someone's faith is, they can pray, proclaim to have faith, as James said, but if they don't have evidence, they don't have any works in their lives that demonstrate that they're truly trusting Jesus. He said that faith is dead. Well, the same is true with repentance. If, if repentance does not have fruit that follows it, that shows that there's been a transformation of the heart, of the mind, metanoia, uh, a change of heart, a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior, which is the fruit of repentance, not repentance itself, uh, then it's not true repentance. It's dead as well. So, you know, when, and let me give you some examples in scripture uh, that I think are really, really clear. By the way, repentance also is not penitence, you know, uh, as Roman Catholicism says, which is like you make a payment uh, to God, you know, because of your remorse or, or uh, repentance is not simply sorrow, uh, the Bible talks about having a worldly sorrow that leads to death. Uh, you know, Judas had a worldly sorrow, but it led to death. Uh, Esau, he was sorrowful even to the point of tears and he gave up his birthright, but it didn't lead to repentance. It didn't lead to life. Uh, true biblical repentance is, starts with godly sorrow. And the godly sorrow is not repentance in itself, but it leads to it. And Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 7.10, he said, you know, godly sorrow uh, produces repentance, which leads to life. Uh, which leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow leads to death, or as the NLT has it, leads to spiritual death in contrast to uh, the, the godly sorrow, which leads to or produces repentance, leading to salvation, it says, which does not leave regret. So uh, it's important that we understand that even sorrow is not repentance, but godly sorrow produces repentance, which leads to salvation, i.e. it is uh, uh, critical to have because uh, it leads to salvation and what have you, where worldly sorrow leads to death. Now, it's interesting uh, to just, since we're going to spend a few minutes on that, as far as what repentance is, and we'll get to, is it, you know, critical? Is it imperative? Is it conditional uh, to have salvation? Which the answer is absolutely yes. But to find a little bit further, uh, true repentance does, ha does have fruit. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, mm -hmm. John the Baptist declared, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, he said this to these Pharisees who were rejecting uh, John the Baptist's testimony, would reject the Messiah for the most part. Some would come to him later. He said, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So true repentance has fruit. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. That's his said faith, right? These empty professions, which are so popular today, you know, oh, I, 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 Jesus is my savior and people just live wicked lives. And they don't bear fruit and keep with repentance. For I say to you that from these stones, Jesus says, God is able to raise children to Abraham. The ax is already laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Grace, in Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 20, speaking to uh, King Agrippa, he said, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those in, of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God per, uh, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. So if there's no deeds as evidence of repentance, it shows that someone's said repentance is just a sham. In fact, Jesus gave just a really wonderful and awesome illustration of repentance when he spoke of how Jonah uh at Jonah's teaching, uh, the city of Nineveh had repented, and he's upbraiding, you know, the city's 
uh, near where he had grown up and so forth, and where he'd grown up because they had so many miracles and they still didn't repent. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, where it's recorded, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is someone greater, or something greater than Jonah is here. Now, it's interesting when you go back and look at what it means, because the word repent is actually not used in the book of Jonah, but Jesus says that they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So we have to look at what they did or what God accepted as repentance uh, to see what it actually entailed. So we go to Jonah 3.10, we read this. When God, God saw what they did, how they turned, and I'll check this out, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. So it was actually a turning from their evil, literally, quote, they turned from their evil way. So uh, the repentance is actually like faith. It's something that happens in the heart, right? Something in the mind. It's a decision that's made. It's not meritorious. We don't own any, earn anything from it, but it's a decision to turn away from rebelling against God because we're all on this broad road that leads to destruction, right? And it's interesting. One of the things I've noticed through my study of Scripture through the years is that there's at least three places, three clear places in the New Testament. There's actually one more as well, but three clear ones where it mentions repentance and faith or belief in the same verse. And each time you see this, because for me, I think it's important that we understand, uh, the Bible doesn't teach a belief without repentance. It doesn't teach repentance without faith. So you have some people that they'll circle, you know, several patches, passages which mention faith and say, oh no, you know, faith is important, but repentance isn't important, you know. Others will underline and underscore repentance and not talk about faith. But it's not an either or situation because God puts the two together and you can't have true faith without repentance and true repentance without faith. They're like Siamese twins, like two sides of the same coin. And when you get to understand what repentance is, you understand why it's essential to have repentance if there's genuine faith. And that's very important to understand. So it's it's interesting when we look at this, uh, it's also important to understand, again, that when we're talking about repentance, we're not talking also about cleaning your life up. And I'm going to make my life morally righteous. You know, I'm going to perfect myself. And then I'm going to come to God. That's not repentance either. Repentance realizes that you can never be acceptable by, to God based on your behavior. It's actually a, a hating your rebellion against God and not looking at your own behavior and turning from your wicked behavior to Christ and placing your faith in Christ. And by grace, we're saved through faith. So it's when we turn to Christ in faith and embrace him as a Lord and Savior that we're actually saved by that grace through faith. But guess what? You don't turn in faith to Christ unless you're turning from something. And I think this is very important to understand. And that's why it's important that we understand the various scriptures that underscore what repentance is. And it's interesting because in the book of Hebrews chapter six, the first verse, it's talking about the fundamentals of the faith. It's talking about the initiatory fundamentals of the faith, how you come to faith, you know. And in Hebrews 6, 1, it states, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, the ABCs of the faith, and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. So notice that repentance is from something. It's repentance from dead works. That's our sin. That's our rebellion. That's trusting in the things that we do. Repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So he's encouraging them because in the chapter that precedes chapter 6, chapter 5, the last few verses there, he's heartbroken. He wants to talk about the deep things of the Melchizedek, who Melchizedek was, and I was a picture of Christ. But he says, I can't do this because you guys are dull of hearing, because you're still babies. You ought to be teachers by now, but I can't even give you solid food because you're on milk. That's kind of a bummer because the book of Hebrews, as rich as it is, it would be even richer if they were mature <laughs> enough to handle it, you know? So what's, he, he's lamenting that they can't discern between good and evil because they're still babes. And then he says they need to get beyond the elementary things and make sure that they move beyond repentance. But he defines what it is. Repentance from, he says, and this is so heavy when we're defining it, it's it's not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. So th that's one of those places where you see repentance and faith in the same verse, one of the three clear places. And repentance, by the way, always precedes the word faith. It always mm -hmm. precedes the faith. Now, some say, well, you have to believe before you can repent. Yeah, objectively you do. You have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you know, and that he can save you before you can actually turn to him. But guess what? Objectively believing that Jesus is Messiah is not the same as subjectively trusting him as your Lord and Savior. You can The demons believe and tremble. 
They, you can know some facts and say, yeah, I believe that Jesus did that. But it's not until you repent and say, you know what? I'm turning from this life of rebellion and doing my own thing and living for myself and trusting in my own works or my own things or whatever you're doing. And I'm turning to Jesus. So repentance describes turning from, as it says in Hebrews 6, and faith is toward. Now, you could also say that repentance is toward because when you're moving from something, you're also moving toward something. So it's interesting because, and I'll use the illustration that before you can go to Hawaii, when you go to Hawaii, you're also doing what? If you're in Vegas, Sin City, you're leaving Vegas. So you can't go to Hawaii unless you leave Vegas, right? If you're in Vegas, right? So repentance, you can't have faith and trust in Jesus unless you're turning from something. So the scriptures are very clearly revealed to us that repentance entails a heart decision to turn from a wicked life of rebellion against the Lord. So I think this is very, very important. I'll give you a few other examples that I think are really, really important. Uh, we looked at you know Nineveh and so forth, which I think is heavy. But in Revelation chapter 2, you have a woman named Jezebel, and she's a false prophetess. She's mm. teaching Christ's servants, his servants. She's deceiving actual servants of Christ who had been servants to eat things, sacrifice to idols. She's leading them into idolatry. Uh, she's teaching, she's, ha- she's committing, uh, uh, she's teaching them fornication. They're committing fornication with her. This is like really apostate, right? Well, Jesus in his grace, it says he gave her space to repent, King James. Gave her time to repent. Uh, so he gave her space to repent, but she didn't repent of her deeds, of her wickedness. So repentance wasn't just her having to change her mind about who Jesus was. Repentance would have entailed no longer being a false prophetess, no longer teaching idolatry to Jesus' servants, no longer leading them into sexual sin. So we see that repentance does, it's a change of heart, it's a change of mind, but it's a change of heart, a genuine change of mind, a change of the will that leads into a change of direction, a change of lifestyle. In Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, it says the rest of mankind, and this is after the, a series of many of the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments have taken place. Over half the earth has been killed at this point. And we read that it says in verse 20, chapter 9, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. See, we're talking about them not repenting of their wicked deeds. They did not repent of the works of their hands so as to not worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of and of uh, wood and uh, that which can either see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. A little bit later in Revelation chapter 16, amidst the uh, bold judgments, it mentions that they didn't repent under the fourth bold judgment. Then we read about the fifth bold judgment, verse 10 of chapter 16 and 11. It says, And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed God of heaven because of the pains of their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So when God calls repentance, he's calling us to forsake, uh, have a heart to, to leave our sin. He's not saying, hey, you got to be perfect before I'll accept you, but he does demand that you have a, that you in your heart will to, to do his will, to turn to him and put your faith in Christ. And then he empowers us. We, when we put our faith in Christ uh, and we trust Jesus, we're not, only, we're not only forgiven of our sins, justification, but the Lord God gives us empower. He empowers us with the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to live a new life. If anyone be in Christ, the Bible says, is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Truly, those who have truly become new creations and have repented and uh, have actually have a change of lifestyle because that's what repentance leads to. If someone says, hey, I have faith, and James says, yeah, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. It's a, it's a sham. Mm-hmm. Same with repentance. Someone says, yeah, I've repented, but they're, you know, they're, you know, just, uh, you know, knee deep in sin and refusing to leave it. Uh, that's not true repentance. Yeah, amen. And, you know, it's interesting, as you, <laughs> as you were speaking about repentance, uh, a, a woman here, and if you're just, clicking on right now or just listening. Uh, I'm in Texas. That's why I sound a little weird. And I'm inside of a car recording this for you with you guys. Hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. Joe's been teaching a wonderful teaching on this. This is really, really important. But a young girl just walked up who actually did repent today and is now showing up to fellowship. You just walked by. Well, praise the Lord. The The angels rejoice over one sinner that comes repentance. So praise the Lord. Amen. And she said she wanted the same for her sister, so she actually brought her sister. I saw them both just walk in. So I'm just I'm just beyond excited about that. And this all comes 
from preaching repentance. There's something that you spoke on as well. And I think a, a lot of it, and it's something I had said to this young lady as well, when it comes to sin and when it comes to repentance, as you're speaking about, for me as, as a believer, the same thing. If I step in dog poop, I do not let it sit on the bottom of my shoe and just go, well, this is fun. Let me rub it on my face. I clean it off. I'm like, I shouldn't have stepped in that. I should have paid attention. And that's an accident, let alone falling headlong into sin and running at it and just sitting there in the doggy poo poo. That's disgusting. Get out, repent. Sin is much more disgusting than that in the sight of God. And so we want to repent of that. We want to turn from that. And since we're out here, and I know we're, Joe, Joe gave such so many scriptures to you guys and a lot of good explanations, so I know we're already getting pretty deep on this episode, but I wanted to talk about two practical reasons why repentance is so important, because I'm sitting here in Texas as part of the Bible Belt, and one of the things that we talked about over and over again and prayed about was that we could wake people up from this malaise here, a lack of repentance, a belief that you really don't have to be Christ's disciple, because that's what we have found with the people we are sharing here. And you might have heard me already mention this if you listened to the last episode, but if you wanted the fr- finished fruit, the finished product of one save, always save theology, lack of repentance theology, what you can find is something that just happened the other night here in Texas. A guy convinced, hey, bring all your group here. We want Christians here. We're all brothers in Christ. I'm so excited for you to come here. This is God's country, and you're going to be able to come here and hang out and have a fellowship night. And this guy walks into the room. I'm playing guitar. He said, why don't you play a worship song to Jesus? And he's sitting there right alongside doing worship, pounding his knee and and loving everything going on. And as soon as I finish the song, he goes, said, blurts out the F word and every other cuss word alongside to tell me how great the worship song was and the guy Ouch. was drunk as a skunk and and i'm like wow this is exactly what it is this lack of repentance and i shared with him galatians chapter 5 verse 16 and 21 first corinthians 6 9 through 10 that no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of god people are deceived on that because they lack repentance they don't even know what it is so joe do you have any more scriptures? I think this is such an important topic. It, it, like we talked about, we're, we're preaching the gospel out here. This is an important topic. Do you have any other scriptures that you can add on to that to help expand us? Because we want to we want to hammer this home. So if you could share any more scrip- scriptures concerning leaving sin behind, really, when it comes to repenting. Yeah, obviously, uh, we've just you know shared a lot of scriptures that show you that repentance is not only a change of heart and change of mind, but it's a change of heart, a change of mind that actually bears fruit. And of course, the fruit is the evidence of the repentance. The evidence doesn't save you. It's just evidence, as we said before. But it's important because the Lord looks at the heart. He wants genuine repentance. And we're called to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith and if we're truly repentant, if we're truly trusting Jesus. So I think it's imperative that you know we look at these types of verses. And I'll give you a couple more that I think are really interesting that in my own uh, pastoral ministry that they've crystallized in my mind that, hey, if someone's not turning from sin uh, and, and they refuse to repent or, or turn from their sins and as evidence of repentance, a changed heart, uh, that, that, that they're in a, a, a terrible state. They're without Christ and they need to truly repent. And, you know, in another episode before long, you know, we'll deal with uh, the fact that e- repentance is actually essential uh, for salvation, we've alluded to that already because Paul said, you know, that godly sorrow produces uh, repentance, which leads to life or salvation. I'm sorry, he says in that context, which leads to salvation. But there's many other scriptures like that, which we'll get into another time. But just because we're emphasizing in this particular show that those, you know, the first heresy regarding repentance is just, just empty of its meaning that it has, you know, it that doesn't mean you have a change of lifestyle at all, which is nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, there's been even some teachers out of you know, popular uh, teachers like Wilkins uh, out of Dallas Dallas Theological Seminary uh, with, uh, you know, uh, the Grace folks who, some of them, I'm sorry to say, turned Grace into a license for immorality. He was teaching for some time that, yeah, well, yeah, repentance doesn't mean that you're actually, doesn't involve actually turning from your evil deeds. And guess what? He repented of his view of repentance. Later in life, he said, you know what? Uh, it, it actually does. And he actually wrote a lot, of, lot on the subject that, yeah, repentance does entail 
uh, you know, turning from your evil deeds. Uh, however, he slipped into the other heresy that, you know, what, but you don't really have to repent. It's optional. You know, you can still be saved without repenting, which we'll deal with another time, as I mentioned. But I'll share a couple more scriptures. And these ones are very, very important because Paul was dealing with the Corinthians who were actually celebrating sin, celebrating, uh, I should say, God's yeah. grace in such a way that they felt like, you know, they were libertines, that they felt like Paul's message was twisted to them and they felt like, you know, they were free to just sin and, and live in rebellion to God. And, and they, they were actually celebrating that. And they had a guy in their church that was actually having sex with his uh, his his father's wife, it says. And it may be his father's wife because it's his stepmom or it may be a way of just, you know, not mentioning her name or or Paul emphasizing the gravity of the seriousness of this actual sin. But he's having sexual relations with her. And the church was celebrating it. They were like, well, we get, look at, we can do these. And it was kind of sin that Paul said, we don't even see among the heathen, you know? And it was just, mm. it was a blow mind. And, and they're just, well, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 and 2. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Are you not? To rather mourn, you should, you should be mourning this. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. A little bit later in the chapter 5, he says, purge the evil person from among you. And then he goes on to warn in chapter 6, not to be deceived for those who uh, practice these things, sexual immorality, he mentions adultery, fornication, homosexuality, uh, you know, fornic- you know, all, you know, effeminacy, all these different sins. And he says, drunkards will not inherit God's kingdom. But I think it's interesting, in the second letter he writes to them, He's his heart broken because what's happening is Paul's teachings were getting twisted. But it's interesting uh, the way they are twisting the grace of God. So Paul actually warns them that, I mean, this is very serious. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, because there's still some of them that hadn't repented. He says, I'm afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish and you may be, uh, and may be found by you to be not what you wish. That perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, anger, tempers, disputes, slanders, gossips, arrogance, disturbances. I'm afraid that when I come to you again, my God may humiliate me before you. And I may mourn, interesting, I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past. Now listen to this. And have not repented of the impurity, immorality, sensuality, which they have practiced. So repentance is not just changing your mind about Jesus died, whether Jesus died for your sins or not, it's actually a turning from, a resolve in the heart to turn from a life of rebellion against the Lord. Test yourselves, he goes on to say, to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? So brothers and sisters, man, it's saying really clearly, there, adakamas means fail the test, means be rejected by God. Paul says he's mourning these guys because they haven't repented and Christ isn't in them if they're failing the test and they haven't repented. And it's interesting, he used the word mourn, kopto, the same Greek word he used in chapter five of the attitude they had regarding the man who was refusing to repent that was having his father's wife. And that word is used of what happens at a funeral, mourning a death. And Paul's mourning the spiritual death of those folks at the church of Corinth who think they're saved, but they refuse to repent. And the irony is all kinds, millions of people today are celebrating. They're celebrating grace in such a way. It's the cheap grace. It doesn't change their life. That doesn't change their behavior, but they look at it as a open sesame, a, a password to do what they thou wilt in the church, to just live like hell and they'll enter the kingdom, live in rebellion to God. And they're still saved. And the irony is Paul says, those folks shouldn't be celebrating life. They should be mourning their spiritual death. Brothers and sisters, let's make sure we've repented. And if you know brothers or professing brothers around you who have not repented, cry out to them in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, brethren, if any of you turn from the truth and one converts them back, he'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to the Good Fight Radio Show brought to you by Good Fight Ministries. If you're blessed by this show and would like to partner with us, won't you consider visiting our support page at goodfight.org? Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 2202, Simi Valley, California, 93062, or call us toll-free at 1-866-JC-TRUTH. That's 1-866-528-7884. We hope you'll tune in next time on the Good Fight Radio Show.